GP. I work in a small group practice in suburban Adelaide and when I'm not at work, I spend my time advocating for climate change and health. I've got my own advocacy project called Climate Medicine. I've done the Al Gore um, Climate Reality Leadership Training. But tonight I'm here as a representative of Doctors for the Environment Australia. So Doctors for the Environment, we're a not-for-profit organisation of doctors and students and our fundamental objective is to protect and enhance health by protecting the environment. We're all volunteers. I think we um, punch above our weight and we very much work in political advocacy and um, are expanding now into education. Before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge country. So the nation that we call Australia is stolen land. First Nations people have never ceded their sovereignty of their land and respect is owed to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island nations and First Nations people. Um, I am on Ghana land. Ga um, hello to a group of people in Ghana is Namani and the response is Namani I. So we're just going to learn a little bit of language. So Namani, and I can hear you all saying Namani I over here in Adelaide. Um, if people did want to put where they, which land they're on in the chat, I think that's a sign of respect and a nice thing to do. Um, tonight we're going to set the scene on um, the health effects of climate change, look at the basics of global warming, some of the major health impacts and do some case scenarios. And at the end we're going to talk about action and what we can all do to try and help this awful problem. Um, on the right is an evaluation form. Those GPs who are here, um, I need you to fill this in. It was attached to the email with the Zoom link. Um, if you can get it back to me the next couple of days, that would be fabulous. So fundamentally, climate change is a health issue. Climate change is a highly politicised problem and we think about it as an economic issue, but at its core, climate change is a health issue. The effects of climate change are health effects. The world Health Organisation has set out a plea for urgent action on climate change and health. Climate emergency declarations have been made by the World Medical Association, Wonka, the Planetary Health Alliance and other groups. And in Australia, the Australian Medical Association, the College of General Practitioners, the College of Rural and Remote Medicine, the physicians, the emergency medicine doctors and a whole heap of other groups have declared a climate emergency. Last year, the RACGP released their Climate Change and Human Health Position Statement, and in that statement, they recognise that climate change is a key public health problem. They commit to mitigation and adaptation strategies, both in general practice and in the broader community, and they advocate for policies to protect health. The college considers it important for GPs to understand and communicate about climate change and health, and that we should research it in general practice. Before you can understand something, you need to know what causes it. And so I just want to do a bit of a primer on global warming and climate change, really basic, basic science. So fundamentally, burning fossil fuels releases greenhouse gases, which increases the greenhouse effect, which increases the temperature, causing more extreme heat and changing the climate. So when we burn coal, oil and gas, we release carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and a whole raft of other piddly ones. And these gases go up into the layer of gas, gases that surround our planet. And this gaseous layer basically acts to keep heat in. By increasing this greenhouse layer, what we're doing is increasing the insulating effect of this layer. So basically more heat gets reflected back to the planet. This increases the temperature and has changed our climate. Um, it's important that we remember that when we're talking about increased in temperature, we're talking about an increase in the average temperature. So, you know, one degree can sound quite benign. Two degrees can sound quite benign. Um, you know, like if it's 24 or 25, you can still go for a picnic and a bike ride. But when you plot temperature on a bell curve, uh, like a standard distribution curve, you realise that this um, increase of one or two degrees actually makes a big difference. So for using Australia as an example, between 1960 and 1991, the average temperature in Australia was 21.8 degrees. So if we look under the orange, um, the orange curve, 
21.8 degrees. Some days it was really cold and some days it was pretty hot, but most days, you know, the average was 21.8. Last year in Australia, the average temperature in Australia was 23.3 degrees. And what that means is it shifts this whole curve to the right. And, you know, we still have some really nice days. I've just had a really lovely day here in Adelaide, but some days it's cold. But now we're having more hot days and more extremely hot days. And all this increased heat has massive knock-on effects for our climate. We have increased land temperature, more fires and more droughts, changes in rainfall patterns with less frequent but more intense storms, increased ocean temperature, increased ocean acidification, loss of sea ice and sea level rise. And this square on the right is more than 10 years old, was put out by the Climate Council. How will climate change affect Australia? No, it's how does climate change affect Australia now? The scientists were right. We're seeing these effects. We're having our more intense um, cyclones, rainfall events, hotter and drier conditions, heat waves, sea level rise, storms and drought. And, you know, we only have to look what we saw on the ground last summer when we watched our country burn to know that, you know, things are pretty dire. This is a picture of Kangaroo Island, my own backyard, a before and after shot. Here's Sydney enveloped in a smoky haze. Here's this picture, which is, I think, one of the most evocative and hard to watch images. This is an 11 year old boy who is safer on a tinny wearing a face mask in the water than on land because of this smoke devastating fire all around him. Obviously our oceans are always affected and we are seeing loss of sea ice, um, glacial retreat and bleaching events in coral reefs. And, you know, I think lots of us are pretty worried about what's happening to the Great Barrier Reef and other reefs around the world and the knock-on effects that will have for ocean life. Fortunately for us, there are good people in the world and the Paris Agreement was signed in 2016 and 196 member states, including Australia, agreed to limit global heating to less than 2 degrees and as close to 1.5 degrees as possible. At that time, they commissioned the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, to look at what 1.5 versus 2 degrees would look like. And what they basically found was that that half a degree matters a lot. 1.5 versus 2 degrees is vastly different. And if we want a livable planet, we really need to work to limit to 1.5 degrees. Um, we're, we're tipped to reach 1.5 somewhere between 2030 and 2050. And for us to have a 50% chance of limiting to 1.5 degrees, so a toss of the coin, one in two, a 50% chance we need to halve global net emissions by 2030 and reach zero by 2050. And of course, this is a massive undertaking and it requires all of us to be involved, individuals, governments, business, the lot. Because unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're going to make it if we look at climate um, projections by the end of the century. So 2100, we're looking at um, more than four degrees of global warming. If governments do what they say they're going to do, we might get 2.5, 3.5 degrees. And if we're going to get that two degree pathway, but better yet, our 1.5 degree pathway, we need to rapidly decarbonise and, you know, like get on with it. This is the decade for climate change. 20, 2020 has to be the decade. Otherwise, we've lost it. And unfortunately, there's a whole heap of climate change propaganda. I'm sure people have heard all of these. You know, the climate changes anyway. Well, yeah, it does, but it's the rate and magnitude of the change that's, that's the problem. Or they'll say, you know, the scientists don't agree. Actually, they do. Now, there's greater than 99% scientific consensus that our burning fossil fuels is changing the climate and that this is an extant threat. Any scientist who doesn't believe is an outlier and I would question who's paying them fundamentally. Or they'll just gaslight the whole thing and say the scientists are wrong, you know, so NASA can put humans on the moon but they can't tell the temperature. And just to bring it home, I'd like to play this short um, little clip from NASA. It goes for 30 seconds. There isn't any sound but it shows the global temperature anomaly from 1880 to 2018.
It's pretty confronting, right? Unsurprisingly, this has massive effects on our health. So all this CO2, rising temperature, extreme weather, sea level rises means we're having more heat-related illness and death. Um, severe weather with injuries and fatalities around that. Air pollution, asthma, cardiovascular disease, changes in vector ecology, so diseases spread by bugs. The biggest one being malaria, dengue fever, um, increase in allergens, so asthma, water quality impacts, so cholera being the major standout globally on that, but all these other nasty little blighters here. Water and food supply impacts, so climate change and global warming is responsible for malnutrition, food and water shortages globally is going to become an increasing problem. And, of course, environmental degradation with forced migration, the mental health impacts and civil conflict, which, you know, is a pretty scary thing that I think we, you know, if we look, we know we're all facing in the future. So, yeah, unsurprisingly, climate change has been called the biggest health threat of the 21st century. Um, the World Health Organization estimates that between 2030 and 2050, climate change will be responsible for approximately a quarter of a million additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea and heat stress. This number does not include deaths from smoke inhalation, pollution, other infections, mental illness, extreme weather events, migration and conflict, all of which carry their own problems. The Lancet Planetary Health Journal is a really great place to look for um, journal articles about um, climate change and health. They started a Lancet countdown in 2015 and this is an annual report monitoring global progress on climate change and health. They look at climate change impacts, exposures and vulnerability, adaptation, planning and resilience, mitigation actions, the money and the politics. And Australia started their own countdown in 2018 following the same domains. I have to say that the 2018 MJA countdown is a really good read, really straightforward and worth it. Um, yeah, I got a lot out of that one. And... Um, I'm going to just play this video. Please excuse the slightly cheesy voice. Um, and, yeah, I think it's very helpful. Our response to climate change today will determine the world we live in tomorrow and will shape the health of children across the globe at every stage of their lives. The Lancet Countdown, tracking progress on health and climate change, monitors our choices demonstrating what action, or the failure to act, means for human health. There are many paths we can take, from a world of extremes and uncertainty, where a child has to fight simply to survive, to an environment that creates the conditions that allows them to thrive. If we continue down our current path, a child born today will live through a world that is over four degrees warmer with a changing environment threatening the food they eat, the air they breathe, and the communities they grow up in. Air pollution, already dangerously high in more than 90% of cities, will worsen and further damage their hearts and lungs from the moment they take their first breath. As they grow, food insecurity will rise with children among the worst affected by the malnutrition and stunting that comes from crop failure in a more volatile climate. Throughout their adult lives, they will experience more heat waves, stronger storms, the spread of infectious disease, and see climate change intensify mass migration, extreme poverty, and mental illness. But the future doesn't have to look this way. A global response that limits temperature rise to well below 2 degrees will transform the life of a child born today for the better. Children in the UK will see an end to coal by their sixth birthday and the growth of solar and wind energy resulting in cleaner air across the country. In France, the last petrol car will be sold by the time they turn 21 with cycleways and green spaces 
supporting safer and more livable cities. And they will celebrate their 31st birthday as the world finally reaches net zero emissions, securing a healthier future for coming generations. Which of these two pathways the world... Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm sorry, I've had a technical problem there. I'll just get this back to it. A global response that limits temperature rise to well below two degrees will transform the life of a child born today for the better. Children in the UK will see an end to coal by their sixth birthday and the growth of solar and wind energy resulting in cleaner air across the country. In France, the last petrol car will be sold by the time they turn 21, with cycleways and green spaces supporting safer and more livable cities. And they will celebrate their 31st birthday as the world finally reaches net zero emissions, securing a healthier future for coming generations. Which of these two pathways the world travels down will depend on the decisions of individuals, businesses and governments. And only an ambitious response can ensure that the health of a child born today isn't defined by a changing climate. Visit the Lancet Countdown online to find the latest assessment of the state of health and climate change in your country. Okay, so sorry about that little technical whoopsie. What I like about that is that what it's telling us is we have a choice. You know, which way we go, do we go left or do we go right? What do we do? And that, you know, what we're doing now is the time that, you know, will change and shape the future of our planet. So now I'd like to kind of move on to some case scenarios, some ideas of things that... Um, I'm certainly seeing in general practice now some of the health effects that I'm already seeing. And whether we go left or right, we've already got health effects. So our first scenario is um, Mrs. Esorimenta de Calore. She's an 82-year-old woman who comes in in January with fatigue and weakness. The last four days, the temperature has been greater than 35 degrees. Um, she lives alone. She's on the pension. She's got a history of high blood pressure and heart failure. She's got arthritis, um, bad back, and she doesn't sleep very well. And her medication list includes Carbacil Plus, which is a blood pressure tablet, Lasix, which is a diuretic, and Endet. So um, now there's only if people want to say what they think is happening to you, I'm more than happy for people to sort of start talking. But um, I'm also happy to do the talking. I think I'll do it. So fundamentally, she's being affected by heat. And, you know, as we age, our ability to um, cope with extreme heat decreases. You know, our heart doesn't work as well as it used to. Our blood vessels aren't as elastic as they are when you're a kid and so you can't vasodilate quite so easily. And um, she's got a couple of other risk factors that are important. Obviously, it has been a heat wave because it's been uh, more than 35 for more than three days. Also, she lives alone. So if something happens to her, there's no one to help her. She's on the pension, which means she hasn't got any money. And, you know, she might be worried about whether or not she can afford to turn on the air conditioner or does she have an air conditioner, that kind of thing. Um, as I said, she's got some, um, you know, underlying medical conditions. And also these medicines that she's been prescribed, all of which dry her out. So the PLUS and Carbacil PLUS is a diuretic, Lasix is a diuretic, NDEP is a drying drug. So it's one of these things where the medical profession, we need to be aware of some of the medications that we're prescribing and maybe think differently during heat waves as to how we treat our patients. Um, because fundamentally, heat waves are Australia's most deadly natural disaster and it's only going to get worse. So... In, they're estimated to cause about 1,100 deaths per year currently in Australia. If we look historically, always it's the heat wave that has been responsible for the most deaths. You know, like in a heat wave, we're all worried about fire, and of course we should be. Um, but, for example, at the um, 
massive bushfires in Victoria about a decade ago. 173 people died from the um, fires. 374 people died from the heat. Heat wave can be a killer. And, of course, they're only projected to increase in Australia. Um, this is a lower emission scenario. This is a higher emission scenario. Fundamentally, the hotter it is, the more heat waves we're going to get and the harder it's going to be for human health. There are certain risk factors, obviously the elderly, but also very young people are at risk of heat. Pregnant women are at a lot of risk from heat. You know, when you're pregnant, you're already um, working harder um, to support, you know, a growing baby. Um, mental people with mental health conditions really suffer in the heat. Those who've already sick for other reasons, so heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease. If you work outside, if you're homeless, and if you live in a city, so this is an urban heat map of Adelaide and you can see the blue and you can see the red and obviously down by the water it's much cooler where you've got parklands that are being watered, it's much cooler, street trees make a difference. And so, yeah, for us, for me living in a city, you know, that in itself is um, a heat risk. And what are the effects of heat? So heat exhaustion and heat stroke. So just going to spend a little bit of time here. So heat exhaustion, if you're suffering in the heat, you know, you're going to get a bit of a headache because you're dehydrated. You might feel a bit sick in the guts. You're going to be tired and thirsty. You might be a bit anxious. Maybe your coordination starts to go. You sort of start to feel a bit, you know, off. Your pulse might be weak. You're sweating heavily and your body temperature will be raised if you took it. If that happens to you or someone around you, what do you do? You lie down in the shade. You try and cool yourself down, drink lots of water, get a cool compress or a tea towel, um, get in the shower or bath because this shows that your body is trying to compensate for the heat and if it gets past a certain point and you decompensate and go into heat stroke, you're in a lot of trouble. Heat stroke is a medical emergency. It can be rapidly fatal. A person with heat stroke needs to be in an emergency department to save their lives because, yes, they're going to get the things that you think of with heat exhaustion but also they might start to really become disorientated. Their body temperature is going to be massive. They might go into a coma. Um, and, you know, they might also be cool, which means they've run out of fluid. There's no water left in their body and so they've stopped sweating. If you see someone like that, you know, someone passed out on the side of the road on a 40-degree day, call them an ambulance basically. Um, other things we know are heart attacks, strokes and kidney disease. So a study for in the 2009 South Australian heat wave, that summer there was 400 excess deaths due to heat and the highest group were the 75-year-olds who got effects from the heat themselves. But then this one's a bit of a surprise, I always think. Ischemic heart disease, so heart attacks in 15 to 64-year-olds, much younger than you kind of really expect. Um, and then strokes in the 65 to 74-year-old age group, obviously there's overlap amongst these three things. And also we see an increase in kidney diseases in the heat. Um, obviously the kidneys are responsible for a lot of our fluid regulation in the body and so if, they're, um, if you're dealing with dehydration, you're at greater risk of kidney stones, acute injury and urinary tract infections. So, yeah, heat's a bit of a problem. We need to kind of keep cool in the heat. My second scenario is a breathing scenario. So I, here we have Mr Senza Rispero. He's a 16-year-old boy, person, lives in Sydney. There's been bushfires burning around Sydney for the last three months and that day the air quality index is 400. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, Senza identifies as Aboriginal. He lives with his family and he's in year 10. He presents with shortness of breath, coughing and wheezing and has a history of asthma. So obviously Senza has problems because he's got smoke inhalation. Um, an air quality index of 400 is massive. One of his other problems is that he might not have much access